Welcome to Up On Game presents Taylor Scouting. Coach Randy Taylor is bringing his 40 plus years of knowledge to you. This is Taylor Scouting. And now here's Coach Randy Taylor. Flint Cosgrove, man. I'm fired up to, we are rolling brother on the show. Uh, let me start off Clint by uh, saying that uh, coach Randy Taylor up on game network, Taylor scouting is, is the show. And uh, I've had, you know, 40 plus years in college football at, at UCLA, Minnesota, Illinois, uh, and, and UNLV, if I didn't say that, uh, that's a little bit of my background, been in evaluating and recruiting and all of those different parts of college football and uh, the college football recruiting world. This podcast, Taylor Scouting Podcast, which is a part of Up On Game Network and go to Up On Game Presents to find Taylor Scouting, uh, is about education and about some stories that will, will helpfully or hopefully uh, direct us on, on how this process works and maybe have a little fun. And, and you know, I, I've just been a trusted guy and in this business for a long time. So I'm gonna use those, uh, that, that time and information and uh, all of my contacts like our, our guest, which I will introduce to you in a second. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, I talked about Up On Game Network, Up On Game Presents on all of your apps, where you find your apps and podcasts. Uh, you can follow them on Up On Game Network, and you can follow me on Twitter at our Taylor FB Scout. So we are going to get into this with uh, a long, long, long time friend. Uh, I was there when the young guy was born. Uh, <laughs> there's stories about that, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Uh, what I will say is welcome Clint Cosgrove and, uh, Clint is, uh, with rivals and he's a national, uh, scout national evaluator, um, is a fantastic recruiter evaluator. He he's always been a guy that sees the big picture, uh, and he's a player's guy. I think that's how, why he's so successful is, is he relates to, uh, kids uh, at all ages and even old guys like me. And, and when you can come on a show with your hat on backwards, then you must be able to relate with anybody, right? So this is Clint Cosgrove. Clint, give us your background. Oh gosh. Um, well, uh, it started when I was born and uh, Coach Taylor was there. And uh, so that was, uh, that's how I got into this world. But um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, my background, I grew up the son of a coach, obviously, and that's how I've known Coach Taylor for so long. Uh, you know, my, my, our families are, are, are the best of friends, and uh, obviously we've stayed in contact over the years. But, you know, growing up as a coach's kid, you have a dream of, you know, playing in the NFL. I found out sooner than I would like that that wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, I, I played a little college ball, got hurt, transferred to a different school, transferred to Arizona State, just went as a student. And then the second I graduated, I hopped right back into the football world. And uh, Bill Callahan was, uh, you know, nice enough to, to hire me uh, in a role that was kind of new to college football at the time. He had come from the NFL. And uh, it was basically, we were kind of the first analysts and quality controls that college football had. Um, it, was, it was an interesting process because they had to find a way to hire us and uh, I think they did it through the video department or something. And um, so, yeah, so that's how I got it uh, started. Uh, basically, you know, breaking down film, uh, making game plans, uh, scouting reports, uh, recruiting meetings, uh, organization of recruiting, recruiting weekends, running scout team once they finally allowed us to after we got through all the NCAA rules stuff because it was just – such a new thing at the time so uh that's really where i started my my football career as a professional uh learned a ton there uh learned how to grind i guess there 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 was a there was a lot of sleepless nights but um you know i loved every second of it there was you know there's nothing like walking into that stadium with a hundred thousand people and and um you know, you don't get to do that after college for most people. And so for me to do that, you know, it was a blessing. And then I was fortunate enough 
uh, a guy named Tim Brewster, who is now the uh, he's a, on Coach Prime staff at Colorado, uh, got hired as the head coach at Minnesota. And uh, when I saw that happening, I knew that my mentor, Coach Randy Taylor, would <laughs> would likely be joining that staff. I hit uh, I hit you up immediately, and um, geez, uh, it was a you know within 24 hours, I think Brew offered me the job to come up as a defensive graduate assistant, and um, you know I spent some time there. Uh, you know, forever thankful to Coach Taylor for that. And, uh, you know, as, as the longer I was there, the, the more my role grew. You know, the, the first year, Everett Withers was our defensive coordinator. He had just come from the NFL. I probably learned too much football and got too little sleep that year, and we weren't very good. Um, but, and then after that, Coach Ted Roof came in as the defensive coordinator. So I got to learn from him as well. Uh, another great football mind. Um, and I was given more responsibility then, you know, started, uh, you know, being able to coach my own position drills, uh, gave me the box as far as, you know, secondary adjustments and stuff like that. And then, uh, <laughs> the third year I had another new defensive coordinator who happened to be my dad. So, uh, he came in and was my boss. Uh, and, um, you know, that was fun. I was, I, you know, I, I love working with my dad. And so uh, that was the start from there. I went to Dartmouth as outside linebackers and Nichols coach, uh, recruited the Midwest, and then uh, decided to get out of coaching. And lucky enough, again, Coach Taylor was there to help me land on my feet. Um, got a job working with him for a while and then ended up at National Preps as a scout. Uh, for eight years, and that's a scouting service that is used by hundreds of colleges to identify, evaluate, and gather information on recruits, get them to the colleges, you know, before they have stars, before they have the, the rivals profile and all that stuff, and um, and then, uh, you know, I wasn't looking for a new opportunity, but a new opportunity came my way, and um, I am now with Yahoo, and uh, I am a national recruiting analyst for Rivals.com. So I just made a pretty simple story uh, pretty long. <laughs> well, that's that's how coaches do it. I mean, there is a uh, – <laughs> you're always coaching, and it's all about the details. And so I, I expect nothing less from a college coach or, or a coach in general is to talk details and go into uh, everything that's happened because that's important, and it gives everybody – the indication and the information about you and where you came from. And, and then they could kind of figure out that, you know, Dartmouth, he was with these guys. Who were some of the guys at Dartmouth? Oh gosh. I mean, Calvin Thibodeau was our D line coach. He left us after a year. Uh, he was coaching at Oklahoma as the D line coach. I think he might be at SMU or Houston now. I don't know. I talked to Tim every now and then I can't remember. Um, uh, Darrell Jackson, who's the head coach at Texas College now, but he's been on staffs at uh, geez, everywhere. He was he, he's a Mike Leach guy, so he's at Washington State. Um, he Mississippi State. He's he's been all over the place. Uh, Don Dopes. I mean, he's a legend. He is still the defensive coordinator at, at, at Dartmouth. Um, Jim Pry, whose son <laughs> I lived with Jim for a little bit when I first got to Dartmouth. His son is is. Uh, the head coach of Virginia Tech now. Uh, I mean, there's just so many guys. It's crazy the amount of coaches that came through there that have gone on to have success. Mike Bruno, who's been at Mississippi State, Cal. He was the linebackers coach at UNLV last year. I, I'm trying to think. I mean, there was some. There was a lot of guys who are big time coaches now that came through there, and uh, you know that was that was a blessing. And I worked for for Buddy Stevens, who's a phenomenal person who's been the head coach at Tulane, Stanford, and, uh, you know, he's still at Dartmouth. So uh, just just so many great people uh, when I was coaching there. You know, and, and I brought that up for two reasons, because I wanted to say Don Dobe's name on the podcast. <laughs> you got it. He's a, <laughs> yeah. he's a legend. I know he is. And the other is, is I wanted to use the line that uh, you coach at Dartmouth. You didn't go there. No, so, gosh, gosh, gosh. yeah, it's it's not like you're an Ivy League guy, right? 
no question. And people would be surprised that I did get recruited by the Ivy Leagues. They must have not seen my transcript. Um, but uh, it is always funny when I tell people that I met my wife at Dartmouth and I, I, I make sure to let them know that I did not go there. <laughs> I, uh, I only coached there. Let's be sure to say hi to Amy here, okay? Because we got to give her a little love. Shout out to Amy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> give her some love. Yeah, absolutely. So, so coach, uh, with rivals, how does the process work? Now we've had different scouting service and, and internet gurus on uh, in before, and so we've talked about their process. Some of it's probably very similar, but how does how does rivals process work? Ooh, I don't know where to start and where to end. Um, it is so, I mean, first and foremost, the, the, the one thing, so I don't have a journalism background. Um, I am a football guy through and through. I'm an evaluator. I'm a recruiter. And so I kind of approach the role, even though it's, it's, you know, very different in many ways, but you know, it has some similarities. Uh you know, like I, like I did as a coach or a recruiter or a scout. And um, there's just so much that goes into it. So the, the, the process is first, a lot of people think they get their stars uh, and then they get their offers. And that is just not the case. It's the other way around. Um, when I first got to arrivals, I'd be doing what I was used to doing, finding the kids who nobody knew about who was going to be the next Jameson Williams or the next, you know, big time kid. And I found out quickly, you just don't have time for that. Um, you are covering these players recruitment through and through where they're visiting, who they like, which coaches they're talking about, recapping visits, uh, breaking their commitments. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. So the job as a whole uh, is, is very, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, but as far as the, the rankings and, and, and ratings process goes, it's uh, basically we start when you uh, have offers, basically. Um, now, we have individual team sites uh, that will cover guys that maybe have not been offered by a school, but have visited there. We have high school sites like Edgy Tim, who's, who's another legend in this business where he can cover whoever he wants, you know, as a national uh, recruiting analyst, my role is to cover the guys who are newsworthy, who the fans want to, that are national recruits with power five offers. Um, so that's a big part of what I do. And then as far as the rankings and ratings and everything like that, there might be a kid who's, who's a future star, but if they aren't newsworthy and they aren't the guy who's being recruited by uh, you know, uh, big schools that, you know, people want to read about, uh, we kind of take our time with them. We're not just throwing them in the ratings, uh, giving them stars and everything like that. So um, it's a very detailed process. It's a very, I don't, it, it's very process oriented, I guess, um, yeah. you know, and then when it comes to rankings and ratings, you know, we sit down in these meetings, we've got a list of guys, who have the offers that we need to get stars on. And um, it's, it, it's a, it's a process. I mean, this is a, this is, I've probably worked 360 of the last 365 days. And uh, it is, it is a, it's a grind. It's a beautiful grind, but uh, it's a very detailed process. And um, you know, it's, it's just not coming from this world. It's, it's a lot different than you would expect. Yeah, and, and I think that's why I wanted to get that discussion going because uh, families, parents, you know, who are always a little bit uh, rabid in this uh, si system and process, think that that you're going to get them uh, scholarships or you're going to get them stars, and and you're media and you write yep. and report about those kids, like you just said, that are getting attention and that are the high profile guys, and so. I think it's important to understand how the process works and not, not get ahead of it and think just because, excuse me, too many kids uh, I think are worried about getting stars because they think it's going to get them recruited. And, yep. and, and it's really just about, can you play or not? And your arm no, length and, and all those things. Yeah. Yep. How, so do you rate your stars or stars rated on the colleges that offer them? How, how does that work? 
So, I mean, like it's, it's a very complex process. There's not a cut and dry answer to that. I would say, um, you know, if a guy's picking up 20 plus power five offers, obviously you're going to take a deeper dive, but the offers don't necessarily dictate the stars or the rivals rating or where they rank, you know, for instance, uh, there's a big time kid or kid I think is big time <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in Chicago. And we just released our first rivals 250 uh, for the 2025 class. And he debuted, he went from no stars to he is the number 17 player in the nation, I believe. And, um, you know, he's a regional recruit right now, but I've seen enough from him to know that he is going to be a big time national recruit. Um, and so the uh you know the the process is different i guess for each class uh you know we're not going to sit there and rank guys and and evaluate guys who aren't being recruited uh, i think like you said that's a that's a very important thing to note there are a number of guys who won't have stars in this tw initial 2025 ranking that will go on to be nfl players will go on to be highly ranked kids i think of malachi coleman last year who didn't even really play varsity until he was a junior started out as like a 5.5 three star and he ends up you know a top 50 player in the nation um you know it's just growth and development we continue to evaluate we update the rankings quarterly um so three times a year we are reevaluating the stars reevaluating the new guys who have offers and uh, really the rankings process comes down to, we sit down in a meeting and we'll go for eight hours straight, maybe run down to take a bathroom break a day. And, um, and we'll go through every kid that is, uh, is, you know, worthy of stars, I guess you would say, uh, whether it be, you know, they have high end Mac offers or they have Mac offers and they're a kid who could be a power five kid or, you know, in the, in the, you know, the later classes or the next class up like 2024, um, you know, really start getting to the nitty gritty because uh, as you get closer to the all American games and all of that and, and closer to signing day, you really got to, you know, get down and, and find out, you know, where each player sits and, and uh, you know, where they sit at their position. And it's not all based off offers, but, there are certain schools, I would say, that you trust their evaluation and if they're going to take a kid <laughs> and, and you like them as well, um, you know, that bodes well. But uh, we make our own decisions at, at the end of the day. And um, it's not one person, you know, I, I have for some of the Midwest kids, I have to stand on the table because they don't get the same amount of exposure. Maybe the rest of the analyst team hasn't seen them unless they go to a rival's camp. And uh, so it's a complex, it's, it's a very complex process. And once again, a very long answer to a simple question. Yeah, it, but, but it, it's important because of, of the process. When do you start looking at 2025 20, kids? How, how does that work? Yeah, so we released an initial 100. Uh, my first 100 that I did was right after I got hired on. Uh, I can't remember when the initial 100 was. This time we actually ranked them in order, but it's just basically identifying 100 kids in the 2025 class. It's probably happened five, six months ago during season and, um, and saying these guys are ones that we know are going to be elite recruits, <laughs> elite recruits uh, as of right now. The crazy part with that is, you know, half of the 2025 guys may have not even been on varsity yet may have not hit a six inch growth spurt. So we, 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 we take those guys that are being recruited, we evaluate them, put them in order. And then four or five, whatever months later, we sit down and then we do the deep dive and do our first 250 and then award stars to guys um, who may not be big time power five guys or whatnot, but we've seen out in person uh, that we really like the film of. You know, and once again, guys that for the most part have offers at that point. And then, you know, we we start with that list. And sometimes these guys are in the top 100. All of a sudden they're like 216th and they're like, why did you drop me? And uh, it, it's not a dropping. It's just we evaluated a good 500 new kids with offers since then. And then we just, you know, adjust accordingly. And you may start 
with nothing as a 2025, no stars, and you could end up a five star by the time you graduate. So um, this class, like I said, they rank them quarterly, or we rank them quarterly. And um, so the, these guys will be rated and ranked and re-ranked and re-evaluated and scrutinized uh, another like eight times. So it's a, it's a, it's a long process. Do college coaches use you and, and rivals? How is that relationship? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's different for everybody. Uh, just my background, I, my best friends are all college coaches. So, uh, I mean, the kids I grew up with aren't, and they kind of follow this stuff, but they're not, you know, talking to me about it or getting the nitty gritty unless it's like their team that they really like. But um, there is a relationship, but as a media member, I have to be non-biased. I, you know, I can't share stuff with one school and not with another. And so I try to be very, you know, cognizant of that. Um, but if, you know, if a friend asks about a player, I'm going to tell them about them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the schools I found, and this is one thing, you know, growing up, I was taught, I was media trained at a young age. Like I would, cause this is what, no offense to my fellow media members, but this is what they used to do. I'd show up at a practice. I'm 10 years old. I heard something at the house. They'd strike up the conversation. This is a guy I recognized from TV or the, you know, the, the newspaper. And I'm like, oh, this is a friend. And, you know, you share something that you think has no bearing to it. And all of a sudden your parents are like, uh, what are you thinking? You, you cannot talk. So like I, like many college coaches, always been paranoid <laughs> of the media. Now I see a different side to it. And I also see what happens with schools who basically know how to do PR. They know how to work with the media. And, um, you know, I, I think a great example of it would be Wisconsin right now. Even though I played there, my dad coached there forever. I knew half the guys on the staff, like there wasn't a lot of communication. This new staff from Cincinnati comes in and, uh, you know, they know the more exposure that they give their program, the better. And the more information we get, the more we're going to report on them. If it's hard to get information, yet you have this school over here giving information, giving access, um, you know, it makes it a lot easier to report on. And like I said, at the end of the day, we are news. We, we are, uh, you know, getting inside information for our subscribers on top of doing the ratings, uh, you know, evaluations. And, and everything like that, you know, commitment interviews, whatever it may be. So uh, the media role is an interesting one. Uh, it, it can be a very powerful tool um, for for these college programs when when used the right way. I guess. Yeah. The uh, the how important are stats on players? Uh, I. I get beat up on Twitter and message boards a lot, but I kind of went on a rant because I was just tired of parents talking to me. Why is this kid getting recruited? Because my son's stats were way better. Stats have literally nothing to do with the recruiting or evaluation process. You know, uh, maybe stats will grab your attention and make you take a closer look. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is about body mechanics. This is about length and height and bend and ankle flexion and upside. And who are you going to be three years from now? Not who you are now. And, you know, uh, you know, if a quarterback, you know, throws a quick hitch and they've got a dude out at receiver who goes for 99 yards, that shows up on the stat sheet as a 99 yard pass, you know. If a running back runs through the middle and nobody touches him and he runs a five five forty, but he's just through everybody and you know, maybe he gets hawked at the five yard line, but it's a seventy yard run, like yeah, it goes on the stat sheet is seventy yards, but he got hawked from behind and and really the stats tell just such a minute part of this whole story when it comes to recruiting. Yeah, I, I I get that, and I'm I'm the same way. I look and I'm looking at body type and all those things that you guys are are doing, and and so what that leads me into is then uh, the camp, combines and camps is where you have your own. How how many rivals camps do you guys run? Jeez, uh, it really depends on the year. I think this year, what are we? I was just in LA this past weekend, so we had that one. Uh, we've got Atlanta 
Dallas, LA, like I said, Cincinnati, New Jersey, Atlanta, and then we'll have a five star. So I think it's like seven this year. I think we did eight last year, but we also have the combines on top of that. Like we'll have a combine in St. Louis, but we're not doing a camp there. So the combines, anybody can go to. Um, some guys get invited to the camp out of the combine. I think we had like eight or 10 in LA. Um, and then, you know, the camp portion is basically invite only guys who we need to get eyeballs on. And it really, uh, it's a great opportunity to see them compete against the top players, but then also, uh, it, you know, it can save us a lot of time because uh, these top players, I got to see them in person, you know, and it's, it's great if we can get them all in one place at one time. And, and that's why the camps are so valuable. Do you attend other camps? I mean, like satellite camps and colleges, D3 will host camps. Do you go to those other camps? Yeah, I do. I mean, um, let's see, when, when we were scouting at National Preps, uh, I would like to take that as my vacation time. And we worked with a lot of these schools. And, you know, as a part of that, like, I didn't want to be going to somebody's camp and then, like, sending out evals on kids from their camp that they're trying to recruit. So I didn't do as much of it then. Uh, but the, the mega camps I usually went to. And then as a, a rivals analyst, you know, I was that. Uh, I went to North Central's, uh, you know, three days. They had, you know, a different group of colleges there each day, usually like a main host school, whether it be Minnesota, Missouri or something like that. And, uh, and then, you know, tons of the colleges from D3 or D2, FCS and Division One. So, yes, I do attend those. Um, geez, I go to everything. I mean, whether it's a <laughs> seven on seven, it's a, a workout, a training session. Um, you know, I try to see these guys in person as much as I can. So stars can really be uh, given and taken away by eyeballing some of these kids. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. And, you know, some of these parents and kids will get so upset when, you know, their, their rating drops or something like that. And, the reason for it being like some of these guys will blow up early and then they will never, they, they just don't yeah. progress. They grew early, you know, maybe they get a little bigger, but their athleticism doesn't continue to grow with their body. And then, you know, the other thing is I would rather start a guy off low, even if I have high, you know, uh, I really think they're going to be a high upside kid or end up being a big time recruit uh, just so that they can kind of work their way up. We never want to drop a kid you know, but because of the way team recruiting rankings work and everything like that, you just, at the end of the day, you, you, you've got to get it right. And, um, and, and that's what I would say to all the parents and kids out there. We would rather start you low and move you up because the guys who start out high early, you know, maybe they'll end up even higher at the end, but a lot of the times they drop throughout the process until we get to that end part and if they're a dude, they're going to end up where they should be. And if they're not a dude, well, they, 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 they might end up a lot lower than they started. So I always say that I would rather start a guy low, learn more about them, watch their recruitment evolve, and then bump them accordingly as we go through these rankings meetings. Do you have a key as far as what a five-star is as far as level of play and a four-star and a three-star? Do you go to two and one? I mean, are those stars ever given? Yeah, two stars. Um, so there's actually on the rival side, it gives the whole breakdown, um, uh, you know, uh, verbiage and everything like that. But a five star, we usually have around 32 of them. And that's no coincidence. There's 32 first round draft picks. If you were a five star, you are supposed to be a first round draft pick. And that's why you don't see a lot of five star running backs. You don't see a lot of five star linebackers and uh, you don't see a lot of five star tight ends. And uh, so when you're getting into that level of player, the stars, a lot of it comes down to NFL position value, because at the end of the day, that is what we are. <laughs> you know, they go back and uh, either beat us up or love us up on, you know, it's uh, it's a five star is, is a future NFL draft pick. So not only do you have to be a great player, you have to have the prototypical measurables to be a first round draft pick. And if you don't, you've just got to be an anomaly and an absolute freak in a different way. A four star is a potential first round draft pick, second, third, you know, kind of like the first second day kids. Uh, they're supposed to be, you know, all American candidates. Three stars are usually power five, uh, you know, projected starters, potential all conference guys. 
uh, that would be uh, have good potential to be draft picks. Two stars are usually mid-major type players um, that, you know, uh, could break. I mean, there's a lot of two stars drafted. There's guys with zero stars drafted, you know. Uh, the one thing you got to remember is these guys are so young in their football careers. There is so much development done. And that's why I, I would say, especially places like, you know, the Dakotas or, you know, the upper Midwest where these kids just grow and develop later because they don't have the access or, you know, the talent around them to really get going early on. Um, that's why you see that. And, uh, you know, it's impossible to guess that some 6'2", 260 pound walk on is going to end up being a first round draft pick, you know, four years later. The thing that I will say is the track record's pretty impressive coming in from the outside and looking at the statistics. I mean, the NFL GMs and, and scouting departments and all of that, they've got an additional three to five years after when we first start ranking these kids. They have private investigators. They have a combine. Yeah. They do mental aptitude tests. Like, we don't have that, and they still miss. So, um, you know, I'm proud of what we do. Could it be better? Absolutely. But um, I would say the track record kind of speaks for itself. I think that was kind of the misnomer about the stars that I wanted to, to get to. And, and I, you said it perfectly, is that it's not, it's not about what college you may end up playing for. Uh, you know, it's about the top end of you as a player. And, and that's where that's the NFL side. So these, these really good college football players aren't five-star guys or aren't four-star guys. They're, they're mostly three-star players. Yep. Yeah. And that's why the majority of the draft is, is three-star players because that's what the majority of the, the star ratings are, you know, uh, you know, there's a high percentage of four and fives that go in the first two, three rounds, obviously. Um, you know, this, at the end of the day, it doesn't lie because it's based off projection. It's not based off how good of a high school football player you were. Right, right. Yeah, some, the, of the best, uh, some of the best players end up playing D2 ball. Like the best who put up the biggest stats, it's just they're uh, two inches too short. Maybe they don't run the right 40. It's like, um, you know, it, there you can be a great football player and not have stars and, and you know, not go to a major Division One program. Yeah. Do you rate the, the transfer portal kids now too? Yeah, we started doing that. I do not uh, have a part in that. Uh, but yeah, we, we do. I mean, like, uh, you know, I think of, I'm going blank on his name, but like there's a kid who was a three, five, I think a 5.53 star who went to Nebraska this year, absolutely tore it up. He's transferring out and, you know, he's a, he was one of the highest rated players in our transfer portal rankings. So I don't do anything with that individually. We do have a uh, transfer portal ranking group and we rank the top kids. And uh, it's, it's almost like, the high, well, not totally, but it's a lot like the high school rankings in the sense that they get a new eval based off what they have done. And, um, you know, they get awarded new stars basically accordingly. And, and that group of guys who are doing the portal are that's really what they do and all they do because it's such a different animal isn't it yeah it really is a, a different animal i mean there's going to be input like especially if I, I have a you know i know a kid very well from his high school days and it's only been a year and then you know like our national analysts like gorney and our rankings director like uh friedman the two adams you know the, the, they'll take part in that too because they're pretty dialed in on a national scale of you know where those guys were how they developed and, and what's going on but yeah, it's not all based off the high school stuff. And, um, you know, I just, I have too much on my plate to get overly involved in that. Yeah, it's like the pro personnel and the college personnel. They all have to have their own staff. Yeah. Is, uh, who gets hurt most by the, the portal? What, what, because everybody has a different opinion. I know what I think. What, what, what's your thought on that? In terms of colleges or players? Players. I mean, if, if, uh, uh, you know, is a kid out of high school coming out of high school, does the portal have much impact on him? Yeah, I think it's starting to, um, you know, if, if a school usually took 25 players, but all of a sudden they're taking 12 high school recruits, 
especially if it's maybe your in-state power five and they need an instant fix uh, and they're going to the portal. Yeah. It's less scholarships for high school kids. And um, you know, it, coming out of high school. Yeah. I, I do think it's making a major impact. Uh, and this, this goes from the power five to the group of five to the FCS, especially, um, you know, these, these FCS schools, even they're looking for power five transfers. Uh, and that's, a, that's a spot that a, a lot of kids could have gone, uh, you know, on the bright side is if you go and show out, you know, there's a kid who was at Hillsdale or Hinsdale or Hill, I don't know, in Michigan, D2 yeah. school. Yeah. Um, Hillsdale. Hillsdale, uh, absolute super major freak at receiver. I think he ended up at Arkansas, you know, after one year of playing there, like maybe I don't know his background. Maybe he didn't play much high school ball. Maybe he was a basketball player and he absolutely tore it up, but he had all of the measurables, you know, he's like six, four runs a legit four, four electronic 40 catches everything that comes his way. Watching his film at Hillsdale is like watching him play against it's like watching a big time college football player play against high school kids. Uh, And I know that's good football up there too. That's a good conference. So that just says to the amount of talent and development he had in one year, but coming out of high school, it can, it can hurt a lot of guys. I think you're going to see more post-grads, more JUCOs um, because guys aren't getting the chance that they want uh, coming out of high school, or maybe they would have received in the past. And it's simply a numbers game. It's not based off of their talent. It's based off, maybe their upside isn't that that projects to impact right away and a school needs impact players at certain positions right away and need is probably as important as anything else with colleges i mean if i'm a i need an old lineman or i need a center or a long snapper or this or whatever it is then the their their rating is much higher than than the running back that i don't need or or, or however you would say it our interest or our uh, uh, efforts to get the guy, uh, would be much greater by, by need, I think. Yeah, no question. I mean, it's a trickle down effect too. Like, you know, I look at, uh, Bucky who went up to Minnesota, the dude, you know, is awesome as a freshman, but then he transfers out to Oregon. Well, that's one less, you know, guy who has college experience that Minnesota needs at the position now. So they're looking to fill that with a guy who has proven themselves at that level. And so it does come down to need and uh, it's, um, it's crazy. I mean, it, it'll trickle down from the elite power fives to the power fives, to the group of fives to the FCS, you know, and then ultimately affecting the FCS or the, the high school kids on, on multiple levels. How do you see the NIL in all of this? I know it's a different game. You probably don't get involved in it too much, but it's got to be uh, impacting you because of, this guy's going to go to this school because of the NIL deal. And, and we all know that, that it's, there are certain legalities or bylaws, but it's, it's hard to monitor all that. Yeah. It's the wild West. Like I, I try not to get too involved. You know, if I have a close relationship with a kid and they bring it up um, maybe, you know, we'll talk about it. I don't like reporting on it really. Although the fans want to know about it. So, um, you know, part of my job as a, as a journalist now is, you know, uh, informing the public about it. So I, you know, I, I will, like if it's a, you know, we're doing camp interviews and, you know, I'm interviewing a kid, maybe I'll ask them. Uh, there's some guys who make it clear. And as it becomes like, it just seems so dirty at first, you know, coming from that college world, like, yeah, I mean, NIL has been going on in different forms for a long time. Um, right. But, uh, you know, now that it's legal, it's like, eh. so like, I feel like in the first year, guys didn't talk about it as much. The big deals were reported on. So then all of a sudden, everybody thinks every kid's getting a million dollars, which is not the case. Even the the top, top kids aren't getting paid to play. Um, They go to a school, you know, and some guys are, as, as we've gone farther into it, as NIL becomes normalized, some kids will just talk about it automatically. You know, NIL might play a little in my decision. Now there are players who make their decision based off NIL. There are schools that are doing technically pay for play. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of schools that you would think are doing pay for play that are not, but they present a plan 
and the infrastructure is in place for when they do get to the school to actually profit off of their name, image, and likeness. So it's a it's the wild west. It really is. Um, there's there's a lot going on with it. Uh, yeah, guys are getting played. There's paid. There's there's valuations on players according to where they sign and school and and, and all of that. Uh, a lot of it's vastly different than what's being reported out there. You know, part of my job is I have to be in the know. I have to break news. I'm talking to agents, uh, coaches, you know, off the record, all kinds of stuff all the time, you know, to really find out and get to the nitty gritty on this stuff. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. I think it's going to continue to evolve. I mean, we're seeing it on the seven on seven scene right now. There's people with money who just want to have a, a great team and give kids opportunities that maybe they didn't otherwise have, you know, they're sending them to schools on visits and uh, it's almost like a hobby. It's like having your own team, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ever evolving. It will continue to, I, I think there's a little too much uh, ambiguity with it right now. There needs to be some, type of transparency so we really know what's going on but as of right now it's uh we're we're in the beginning stages <laughs> yeah the the uh that, so let's wrap this up but because that's a ton of information from uh from you I just talk uh, too much <laughs> no you don't it, it's good because you all those little diamonds come out of the rough you know the of the comments that you make and and the different things as you're talking through the process so many important things come out in that discussion that these kids and parents who won't listen maybe, but should, uh, and even high school coaches and, and, you know, they all need this information. And so you're in your position knowing what you know, cause you know, all sides yeah. suggest what prospects should be doing or what, how should a prospect be going about this whole thing? Other than obviously he's got to play, he's got to compete. He's got to be a good player. Um, you know, have good film, uh, know how to make your film, uh, that, that can be a make or break, you know, because a lot of the time, you know, the highlights kind of like your, your, your entry key, and then they'll do a deeper dive if they like the highlight. But if, if you don't show out in the first five plays as a college coach, and I have to evaluate all these guys and make decisions based off of who do we have a chance at, who's good enough to play for us and who do I project as a difference maker? If those first few clips aren't good, like your film's getting turned off, you know? So that's, that's the first thing. Have good film. Um, be seen in person, but know the difference between being a recruit. So as a young kid, am I going to a college camp as a freshman expecting to get an offer? Now, there are some kids who are physically ready that we know are going to be very good, who are, are going to those camps to get offers. You know, I saw a seventh grader this weekend or eighth grader that has an offer from Georgia. The kid is an absolute stud. I see why he has an offer from Georgia. He's at a different level than the kid who's maybe going to that Georgia camp to have fun when they're younger. So you don't want to get evaluated too early and thrown to the curb based off that evaluation. Um, no, are you going to a camp to compete or are you doing it to earn a scholarship? If you're doing it to earn a scholarship and you're not ready, maybe that's not the best camp for you. So camps are important, uh, recruiting surveys, you know, getting at least on that list. So you're getting the mailers, you're getting the information and then really being proactive, um, you know, reaching out to college coaches, casting a wide net. Don't think that any school's too small or too big for you, but do it in a way where you're not annoying coaches and you are um, giving them the information they need. You're not going to talk a coach into offering you. The only thing you're going to do is annoy them. And so that will knock you off the list right away. So really it's getting your name out there, competing as much as you can, being seen as much as you can, making as many visits as you can and casting a wide net. Uh, I don't care if you're a D1 player and you, you know, don't have D1 offers. Uh, you don't just go to D1 camps or only talk to D1 schools until you have those offers and they better be committable offers because there's a lot of guys who shun schools that are smaller. Once they get that offer, maybe they got it their sophomore year. That's not committable. They end up with nowhere to go when they could have been a scholarship prospect or player at some level. So it is that wide net it's relationships. It's, you know, being assertive, 
but not aggressive and not over the top. And uh, at the end of the day, if enough people see you, uh, enough exposure, enough camps, whatever it may be, uh, scouting services, you know, uh, you know, they have the, eye, the ears of these coaches. Colleges are paying for them. You know, it, it's not all about stars at the end of the day. The stars are used to project. The stars are used to rate classes. But um, there's a whole lot that goes on in the recruiting process before that. You, you know, you said a few things uh, that make me love you more than I already do. <laughs> Uh, and one of them, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. Don't tell Shannon and Connor. I, I won't. Hopefully they don't watch it. <laughs> so I've always gone by the, the phrase video is king. And so when I stopped doing some of the things I was doing, I, I'm a editing video for players because I know how important it is and how a bad highlight video can get you excluded quick because it's the yeah. first thing college coaches look at. And, and so that is always, uh, and, and guys, our Taylor FB scout on Twitter. So follow me or uh, direct message me about the editing of your highlight video. Cause it's important uh, at, at every grad le grade level. So uh, definitely we'll, we'll help you with that. But I, I think you said again, so many key things, uh, that I think players and parents need to hear uh, in in your comments today. And, and that's, I knew you'd be good at it and, and have some good insight to it. So I just want to thank you for coming on with us, uh, Clint Cosgrove, uh, Rivals, uh, Guru. Uh, what's the best way for, and I don't want everyone sending you uh, highlight tapes or videotapes, what's the best way for them to get at your attention? uh go out and compete and catch my eye somewhere uh i can't get through my dms i don't see half the things i'm tagged in i get tagged i think over a hundred thousand times like in a certain time span so like it's hard to keep up on all of that um you know do take care of yourself take care of your business you know uh train hard work hard uh you know make it be known that to your your high school coach that you want to play college ball uh, if you do feel that you can compete with the best, go out and compete with the best, uh, whether it be seven on seven camps, you know, your high school, obviously, first and foremost. Um, and then, you know, I'm around, I, I, I'm not too hard to find, but, uh, at the same time, I do get overwhelmed a little bit in this new role. I, you know, behind the scenes, we could kind of, you know, the local guys that saw us all the time knew who we were, but with this, you know, it's just your, your face is out there a lot more. So, um, I'll find you eventually, uh, but, you know, take care of your recruitment first before you worry about the stars, get good film, go and compete with the best, show up, show out, do whatever you can. And, uh, <clears throat> when it's time and I'm allowed to, you know, uh, you know, put a lot of time, thought and coverage into you that, that will happen. It, it, it happens through the work you put in beforehand. Uh, through the offers you get and then ultimately uh, when you become you know all Americans and stuff like that you know I have to cover the guys that people want to know about so um, but my Twitter is at rivals underscore Clint um, you can follow me uh, there's a chance I'll follow you back uh, sometimes I don't see if people follow me uh, you can tag me in your film like I'm happy like if I get a free moment let's say I'm sitting in the car someone else is driving kid tags me in the film I happen to be in my Twitter I'm going to watch it. So um, there's no set way, but uh, you know, if, if you do the right things in the classroom and, you know, on the field uh, you know, you don't have to find me. I'll, I'll do my best to find you. <laughs> and you mentioned classroom and I, and I would advise everybody that, that if you're a C student, you're not going to be recruited very heavily. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a big time kid in Chicagoland who has like two offers. And he's not rated very high stars wise either, because part of this is we can't be giving out our high rankings to a kid who's never going to play college football and has no chance of going to the NFL. I'm not saying that this kid will, but his GPA is so low that he's not recruited and people don't know how good he is because he doesn't have all that, all those offers. And so that's first and foremost, like when evaluating kids and, and, and doing stars, if a kid's not going to qualify you know, they're not a priority because we have to worry about the guys who are going to qualify and sign. And so that's another huge thing. 
uh, you know, and if you're not good academically, don't worry about your stars. You got to worry about getting that right and getting into school first and foremost. Absolutely. So, hey, uh, Clint, Cosgrove, Rivals, uh, thanks for jumping on with us. I, I love your brother, and and I had your dad on the other day, and he was great. Uh, this did is, you really? I had yeah. him on once, and it was awesome. Yeah, he's uh, he's a good interview. We couldn't tell all the stories we had, but oh, we know. we might have told a couple. But uh, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, just want to do a little business here, closing it out, uh, folks. Subscribe to Up On Game Presents on iHeartRadio app or any of the podcast apps that you use. Rate and review us uh, on this podcast and, and uh, all of our podcasts. Follow us on all social platforms by searching the Up On Game Network. And you can find me on Twitter, mostly at our Taylor FB Scout. Uh, so join in, follow me, get more information, watch the podcast. And uh, really appreciate you being on, Clint, with us. And and uh, go get them, man. And I'll be in Chicago in the near future, so I'll get, get to see you. Yep, I can't wait. I wouldn't be where I am today without you, uh, Randy. You, thank you're, you're the best. You're, you're the five star in the business, man. Um, <laughs> uh, th thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. This was awesome. I appreciate that. Checks in the mail, brother. <laughs> <laughs>